this morning is Matthew 14, 22 to 33. But I just want to share with you, I grew up as a very insecure kid, being overprotected because I was very sickly, and I didn't think that I would actually grow up to be old. So I learned that life was to be handled with kid gloves. Then I grew up, I met Steve, and kid gloves walked out the door. He did not know how to handle life calmly. Life on the edge was the only way he knew how to live. The higher the mountain, the deeper the valleys, the deeper the ski slopes, the bigger the waves, everything. That was the only way he knew to, to live. Then he learned to scuba dive. By this time we were married and of course that's it. No question about it. Nobody says to me, I'm chicken. I'm not going to scuba dive. I learned to scuba dive. And Stephen said to me, Shan, I promise you it's amazing. I promise you it's safe. Safe with him? I doubt it. <laughs> he goes scuba diving to find sharks. He goes scuba diving to look under the rocks and find sharks' teeth. And then he collects them. So any cliffs or things or caves or anything dangerous under the water, that's what he likes to do. There's no safe floating in his vocabulary. I did the training way after him because, of course, I was afraid to do it. And then it was time for me to do my open water dives. I flipped over the boat into the water, and the shock of the depth, the vastness, the sense of, of how big it is I'm down there, and that you are swimming with animals or, or fish that eat you. <laughs> it overwhelmed me. I sank to the bottom, activated the buoyancy vest, and shot to the top. Then the leader of the group told me to go down again and stay down. I sank down, then shot back up again. Sank down and shot back up again. Then realized that if I did not relax, and move up and down and around slowly, I was gonna hurt my lungs. My lungs would explode. By this time, the leader came to my side. We made eye contact and we did all the sign language to make sure that I was okay. Then with him by my side, holding my arm, I got to experience the absolute beauty of life under the sea. There is no experience like it. But when I panicked and lost focus, I sank. When calmed down, I got to experience the beauty and peace. Why do I even mention this? This morning's word from God is all about the reality that the moment we lose focus on the one who is our strength, we sink. Being a writer, I love to analyze verbs, resulting in me looking up the word sink. This is what the dictionary gave me to go to the bottom, submerged, to become partly buried, as in mud, to become engulfed, to become depressed, to fail in health or strength, to be cast down, or bring to a low condition or state, be overwhelmed or defeated. Does that sound familiar? Our passage this morning applies to our storms that we face. Scripture always gives us an answer to whatever situation we find ourselves in. In it, we can find how to prevent that sinking, to prevent the depression, to prevent the feeling of being stuck in mud, to, be, to prevent being engulfed. In a real sense, each day is a hurricane season in the life of the believer. We all experience or will experience going through some spiritual atmospheric disturbance. But when we go through these difficulties, the first thing we ask God is why. Let's take a look at this passage more closely and see how we can actually grasp what Jesus is trying to teach us. Again, it's from Matthew 14, 22 to 33, but we're going to go from verse 24. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the shore, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. 
and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This morning, let's look at six principles to help us make sense of the storms we find ourselves in. The first principle, facing storms helps us to change focus. If we look at the background a little bit, where this whole thing comes from, our passage picks up just after the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. We see that Jesus told his disciples, get in the boat, I will meet you on the other side. After the miracle of feeding the 5,000, the people wanted to make him king. They were going to force Jesus to become their king. We see this in John 14, verse 15. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus knows everything, knowing that they intended to come and take him, make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountainside to be alone. Christ knew what the popular view of messiahship was the Messiah was to lead the Israel in revolt against the Roman Emperor, freeing the people and establishing a theocratic government. This meant the rule and reign of God over all the earth. Sounds like a very good thing to do. The disciples got caught up in the excitement, and Jesus had to send them in the boat to the other side. He had to disperse the crowd in order to calm the disciples and keep them from making a very big mistake. Of course, Jesus knew that they would be fighting the storm. The reality of facing and fighting a storm for survival would calm their excitement. It would change their focus. His calming the storm would also prove who he is and his messiahship, and again show that he was in control of all things. Most importantly though, Jesus needed to spend time alone. He needed to get refreshed and be alone with God in prayer. Christ wanted the disciples to begin learning one of the most important lessons of their lives, and that was his presence would always be with them. Not necessarily his physical presence, but his, his spiritual one. What they needed was to experience and really have a, a real trust in him. The disciples would learn that the Lord's presence makes all the difference in the world. The second principle is Christ's presence is assured by personal preparation. We see Christ demonstrating to us the important factor in life is to get alone for prayer. There are times when prayer is needed no matter what the circumstances are. Christ models this for us by him getting away. He dismissed the disciples and then got alone to pray. Even though the people were ready to acclaim him as king, he knew that his time was not yet. And he knew that human proclamation was the way of the devil. He had to secure salvation for men through his death and salvation and resurrection. Jesus needed time to be renewed and strengthened. He was physically exhausted. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace 
How must we approach his throne of grace? With confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to do what? To help us in our time of need. How cool is that scripture? Let us approach God's throne of grace, not in fear, not in doubt, confidence. And he will in turn give us his mercy and grace. And what? Send us on our way? No, he will help us in our time of need. In our time of need, we go to God in prayer. We get refreshed and energized in Christ's presence. We're only human. And unfortunately, we get tired so easily. We get exhausted. We get tempted and pressured so quickly. We sink. We get engulfed in mud. We fight to keep our minds focused on Christ. And we struggle to maintain a moment-by-moment consciousness of what? His presence. Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 remind us of the struggle. And he gives us the answer how to win. The weapons we fight with are what? Not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have what? Divine power to do what? to demolish strongholds. What are strongholds? Strongholds is anything that stop you from going forward with God. We demolish arguments. Arguments are constantly going on in our minds. We need to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against what? The knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We struggle with this all the time. This lifestyle takes its toll. It wears us down mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Which lifestyle is this? This lifestyle that we're in. The stress that we're in. Our only hope is to learn that Christ's presence and a consciousness of his presence is assured. How can we do this? It's assured by prayer, getting alone with him. We live in a mad rush and are attacked time and time again by distraction and distraction. It is impossible to remain strong and faithful to Christ without getting alone for prayer and renewal. God modeled this for us over and over again. Spend time alone in prayer. Through all these stresses in our lives, God teaches us to trust him. We are not self-sufficient. If we want his presence and if we are going to do what he has sent us into the world to do, we must spend time with him. Principle number three, Christ's presence conquers what? Fear. We see that Christ's presence conquers fear during the storm, the storms that we face, Christ's presence conquers it. A storm arose while they were crossing the lake, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves. The word tossed means to be tossed about with great force. This picture is very descriptive. The boat was tossed about so ferociously that it was in great pain and anguish. The boat was in pain and anguish. The storm arose while the disciples were working. They were doing what God told them to do, and yet the storm arose. How true of life. Storms come upon the just as well as the unjust. Even when God tells us to do something, we face storms. Jesus went to the disciples, but note how he went. He walked on the sea. However, he did not go to them immediately. Why? Because he needed to teach them to trust him and obey his command no matter what happened to them. They were doing what he had told them to do so they could trust his care and his will. Also, they needed to be taught to go about conquering the storms of life by using their own skill and strength. They needed to learn 
to use all the gifting that they had in handling the struggles against the storms of life. Notice, Jesus stepped in only after they had done all they could. Once their own strength and skill had been exhausted, the praise for salvation would go to them? No. Would go to God and his delivering power, not to man. And that's God's aim. The disciples were hit with fear. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Their physical and mental condition is important if we look at it th this point. They were physically exhausted, having struggled against the storm for hours, and they were mentally drained from using all their skills that, at their disposal. They felt their lives were threatened and they were struggling for survival. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, an apparition appears on the water, walking on the water. They were most probably bordering on going into shock, thinking that it was the death angel or a premonition of their death was at hand. This is it. We, we're finished. How many times have you said that when you're in a storm? This is it. I, I can't. I'm, gonna, I'm, in, I'm finished. Then all of a sudden, a familiar voice. You see, it's at those times of the storm that we hear a familiar voice of God. We hear his voice. It is I, be not afraid. Jesus gave them the assurance of his presence. Christ's sudden presence on the water was a great encouragement to the disciples, yet they weren't quite sure it was him. They've never seen someone walk on the water before. Lord, if it is you, how many times have we said when we hear him calling us, Lord, if this is you, I'm constantly doing that because I doubt my, my you know, my, myself. Lord, if it be you, his words and his presence are a marvelous revelation of his care and power to save us through the storms of life. All the accounts of scripture where Christ intervenes, if we look at all the accounts, we will be confident that we don't turn back from the, when storms arise, no matter how terrible the trial. Christ is able to take the trials of life and make opportunities out of them. That's what he does. They strengthen our life of faith. Romans 5, 3 to 5, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because why? We know that our suffering produces perseverance. We hate the scripture, right? Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. When are we going to get this? The thrust of the point made in, in this portion of the storm is so clear. We are helpless when caught in the greatest storms of life. Christ's presence alone can save those storms. His presence alone can conquer our fears and give us what? Hope, hope, hope and security. Storms can be moments of sorrow, self-conflict, temptation, decision-making, or any adverse pandemic circumstance. Christ is ever so near and ready to do what? To help us if we will just call out to him. His presence is most assuring, comforting, and strengthening to us, his true disciples. Principle four, Christ's presence conquers nature. He is the Messiah, the sovereign Lord over all. He demonstrated his Messiahship, proving, adding proof upon proof to this handful of believers to whom he was to entrust his cause. He brought peace to a sea that reeled for their sake. He would always be present to help them, no matter the severity of trial. But they had to learn that he could bring peace to any reeling and hopeless soul that calls on him.
We too have to learn that Jesus brings peace to any reeling and hopeless situation we face. We need to call on him. Principle five, don't get so focused on the storm that you lose sight of Jesus. I'm guilty. We as humans struggle with this issue. We lose sight of Jesus. We don't recognize God when he's waiting to help us. What caused Peter to sink? His faith began to waver because he took his eyes off the Lord and began to look at the circumstance around him. Jesus asked, why did you doubt? The word translated doubt carries the meaning of standing uncertainly at two ways. Firstly, Peter started out with great faith. I'm coming, Lord. Then secondly, ended up with little faith because he saw two ways instead of one. He saw the storm. This is exactly what happens to us. We do not know Jesus as we should. We see two ways to endure storms, with faith or lack of faith. A coach wanted to start a basketball team. A fellow walks in. Nobody knows who he is, but he's very tall. He says to the man, hey man, can you play ball? Man answers and says, I play a bit. Can you dribble? Can you shoot? Can you jump? Can you dunk? Yeah, I can dunk, he answers. Okay, great. We're going to practice at 12 o'clock next Saturday. We'll find out what kind of game you have. We don't know him. The coach doesn't know him, so he's got to see what he's all about, whether he can even play or not. We've got to find out what he can do. A week later, the same guy walks in, but this time, somebody says, yes, Michael Jordan. Nobody asks if he can dribble, whether he can jump, and certainly not if he can dunk. Why? Because they knew who he was by then. They already knew what he can do. Sometimes we forget who God is. When Jesus goes to those disciples in the midst of the storm, you know what he says? I'm going to meet you in your storm. You've got some troubles in your life. You've got some things you can't handle. But I am is on your side. Whenever you're going through whatever you're facing, I am is in your midst. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It could be financial, it could be family, it could be the pandemic, it could be personal, corporate. Whatever you are facing, God is on your side saying, don't worry about what I can do. Just know who I am. Principle six. In the storm, God reveals to us that we're not all we think we are. What does God allow us to realize in the storm? That what we thought was our greatest strength was actually an anchor dragging us to the bottom. We have this tendency to start thinking we can handle everything on our own. The situation or the storm, not a problem, we can do this. We have achieved some earthly level of proficiency in a particular subject. We believe that we are equipped to handle life. The storm, however, puts you in a position where you'll stop taking yourself so seriously and stop taking God so lightly. You will end up crying out for help. Sometimes we don't have time for all the words that we want to cry out to God when we're in our storm. All we can end up saying to God is, I'm sinking, Lord, blah, 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 save, blah, 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 me. <sighs> That's my diary, I'm telling you. The wind didn't stop when, till after they got into the boat. Our problem is we want God to stop the storm and then save us because we think storm stoppage is a requirement for God to move. God doesn't have to do anything to do what he's going to do. The same God who gives you directions that lead you into the storm is the same God who meets you in your storm. He's the same God who will deliver you 
out of your storm. And he's the same God who will walk with you through your storm. God doesn't have to stop the storm. He can come in the middle of the storm and walk with you through it. We don't see God like we need to see him until we go through the storms. Whenever you go through storms of life, God gives you a picture of who he is that you never saw before. It's through the storm you see him not for what he's done, but for who he is. If you know who he is, then you'll know what he is capable of doing and what he can do. Max Lucado, imagine what a journal entry would have been like if one of the disciples had made his entry on the morning after Jesus calmed the storm. The imaginary reflections strike a realistic chord of what that disciple experienced. He writes, I had never seen Jesus as I saw him then. I had seen him as powerful. I had seen him as wise. I had witnessed his authority and marveled at his abilities. But what I witnessed that night, last night, I know I'll never forget. I saw God, the God who can't sit still when the storm is too strong the God who lets me get frightened enough to need him and then comes close enough for me to see him. The God who uses my storms as his path to come to me. I saw God. It took a storm for me to see him, but I saw him and I'll never be the same. The story of Peter and the other disciples on the stormy seas is surpassed only by the perfect walk of our Lord Jesus on the lake. In that walk, we see God. And when we see him clearly and obey his summons on our lives, we too will never be the same. In conclusion, we all face many circumstances for which we are unprepared. We're in a pandemic right now. The difficulties we face change day by day, but the one constancy we have is the life of Jesus. As we go through life focused on an intimate walk with him, through each and every circumstance, we learn how to apply his consistency to our situations. We may never be in a position like Peter, but we can learn from him. When the Lord called him, whether it was to get out of the boat or be a leader in the early church, Jesus was always there to see him through. I wanna leave you with a stirring expression of the perseverance of faith. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little time you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come to you so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Even though Peter and his readers cannot see Jesus, they have learned the lesson of never taking their eyes of faith off of him. No matter what Peter is called by his Lord to do, faith simply means saying yes to that summons. Peter's lifelong story emphasizes an astonishing grace and gentle, restoring power available only in Jesus. None of us have failed so many times that God cannot use us for his purposes, but we must continue to focus on Jesus instead of becoming unsettled by circumstances we have never encountered. This is the key for a consistent Christian lifestyle and for consistency in our lives. He will be there with us. 
to help us make the right decisions, to give us courage in the face of fearful opposition, or to comfort us in sorrowful situations. We must learn to practice the presence of Jesus. Learn to open your conscious attention to him everywhere you go and develop a line of communication with him in all circumstances. We must get a clear vision of Jesus. Many of us have an understanding of Jesus which is cluttered with fragmented or distorted images. There is no alternative God. There is no other action that we can take. The disciples came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. They understood more than ever before. They knew he calmed their storm and he rescued them. They knew him to be the great I Am. Jesus will see us through any storm. If he says, come, then that word is going to accomplish his intended purpose, since he is the author and finisher of our faith. Whatever he starts, he finishes, he completes. This is the only way we can make sense of life in the storms. We may sink along the way, but in the end, God succeeds. Jesus and Peter walked on the water together back to the ship. Jesus will walk with us on the water, on the, through the storm. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning. You are God. You are the great I am. And Lord, I pray that we will just grasp who you are, that we will get to know that it is you. You are our God. There is no other God. There is no other action that we need to take but to learn who you are and to accept the positions that we are facing because you allow them, Lord Jesus, and you will be with us through them. So Lord, I pray this morning for everyone here today and for those watching that you will take this word, Lord Jesus. Don't let us forget it. Don't let us leave. Let it keep coming back, Lord Jesus. Let your word, your scriptures just keep coming back to us. You are the great I am. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that I know you. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that whatever you call me to do, you will give me the strength and you will go with me to it. In your most precious name we pray, Lord.